first segment here of our demonstration of 1989. We're probably going to have to do this in multiple little uh, video segments for uh, compression purposes. Uh, we are recording the demo tonight. We'll be able to put this up on uh, our YouTube channel. So uh, if, if you have to leave early or something, you can check out the rest of it uh, by going to GMT's YouTube channel. Or uh, if, you, if you look online, I'll, I'll probably post a, a video link on the GMT page on Consum World and probably put something on the Board Game Geek uh, page for the game. All right, so this is uh, 1989, and this is kind of a cool game because I, I remember uh, when I first saw this game, it was a DTP desktop published game, and uh, I remember talking to Gene Billingsley saying, hey, you guys really need to look into this. This is really cool. And what I really liked about it is how the, uh, how the scoring cards work in this game. It's going to have some feels... Uh, some feel that's similar to Twilight Struggle, but there's some other things going on that are going to feel a lot like Hannibal or We the People. And that's really kind of a cool cool little game within a game that's happening here. So uh, it's a real neat, neat system. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm just going to give you a basic understanding. We're not going to play an entire game owing to time constraints, but we should be able to give you a good feel for the, the whole system and how the game plays. Uh, basically, what you have here is a map of the Balkans and Eastern Europe. You have uh, the People's Republic of Poland, Democratic uh, Republic, uh, East Germany, that is, German Democratic Republic. You have uh, Czechoslovakia, the, you have the uh, People's Republic of Hungary, you have Romania, and Bulgaria down in the south. And they work kind of like the continents do in uh, Twilight Struggle, but there's a few twists in this one. Uh, the most important ones early on in the game is obviously Poland is a huge, huge deal, especially in the early game. Uh, control of Poland's a big deal. Uh, Hungary is one that's going to come up in the early game as well. And then in the mid game, because the deck is broken apart into uh, three different periods, then uh, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria will come into play. And in the late game, Romania uh, comes into play as, a, as far as a scoring opportunity goes. As I said, the deck is divided into three segments. Uh, you have early uh, year. Early year is kind of like early war and twilight struggle. So you have early year, middle year, and late year. And uh, so if you're if you're comfortable with twilight struggle, it's the same sort of deal there. That when you when the turn record uh, track when the marker on the turn record track reaches the number four box, uh, then the middle year cards will be reshuffled into the uh, draw pile. And then uh, in late year, turn eight, you have the late year cards that are going to be added to the draw pile. Uh, just like in Twilight Struggle, the cards, let me uh, drag out a few onto the map. Let's see if I can get a mix of things. Here we go. All right, so I got a mix of cards here just to give you an idea of what's in the deck. Uh, the cards have an op value on them. This is kind of one of those games where it's a card game that uses a map. Um, that's one way of looking at it. That's the way I've always kind of looked at Twilight Struggle. Uh, so the cards I'm going to start with here because that really is the heart of the game. You have three different types of cards. You're going to have cards that are unaligned and so they're going to have a silver star in the upper left hand corner. There may or may not be an operations value in that star. Uh, with the scoring cards, there's no operations value because the event must be played. The card may not be held in your hand. Um, they work a lot like the scoring cards from Twilight Struggle, but there are some different things happening with them, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. But there are other, there are other unaligned uh, cards in the game system, and those particular cards are going to have an operations value, and whenever you play the card, you can play it for the op value or the event, and if you play the op value, the event is simply ignored. Now you also have cards that are aligned with the Democrat player and with the Communist player. And blue is for the Democrat player and red is for the Communist player. So if I'm a Democrat player, I can play a blue card uh, for the app value or the event. If I'm a Communist player and I've got a blue card in my hand, then I, have a, you know, I can play the card for the op value uh, and the event will trigger because it's the, the event is aligned with my opponent. The event will trigger, just like in Twilight Struggle, or in Labyrinth for that matter. You can choose whether you want to have the event trigger first or uh, second. Basically the same sort of system. 
Conversely, if you're the communist player and you have one of these red star cards in your hand, you can use the event or the ops. If you're the Democrat player, you use the ops, but the event will uh, trigger. And of course, Timing is everything with playing these cards. So if you have a handful of cards that are aligned with your opponent, you can play them safely as long as you uh, usually time them well. And so you can usually do some things in order to mitigate the effects of those, those nasty events. So again, it's the same sort of thing that you have in Twilight Struggle. So not a lot of differences there. So let me go ahead and discard those. And put them back in the draw pile. All right, what you see here on the map, uh, the con you, you basically have cities instead of countries. Twilight Struggle, you had countries that are connected with one another. Well, in this game, you have cities that are connected with one another. And so the connections work just the same as in that game. A city is adjacent to another city, or a, a, a space is adjacent to another space if it shares a common connection line. Now, the spaces have different symbols in them. And if you look at the right-hand side of your map, I'll zoom in here on my screen so you can see it good. You'll find that there is a legend here. And you'll find that there's several different kinds of spaces. The uh, spaces that are, I think, the most common on the map are the ones with the hammer, and those are worker spaces. The ones with a sickle, a little bit less common, those are uh, farmer spaces. Uh, spaces that have like a little church building are going to be church spaces. And you have three different kinds of church. You have the Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, and the Lutheran Church. Uh, elite spaces have uh, uh, an automobile. Then you have student spaces that have the, uh, the victor V for victory sign. You have bureaucrat spaces that have the, uh, uh, the star on them. You have intellectual spaces that have a typewriter. You have minority spaces that have either a, uh, like an Islamic uh, crescent and star, or um, I'm not sure exactly what the other one is. It looks like a little sunburst and a star. There's only, I think, two minority spaces on the entire map, and they are located in Romania and Bulgaria, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, Razgad in uh, Bulgaria, and this place in the middle of Romania that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. So those are the, the different kinds of spaces in the, the, uh, the game, and it might you know, seem maybe a little overwhelming at first, but as you play, you'll start to understand the interaction between the types of spaces and the importance of them. Whenever you play a scoring card, I'll just say this for now, whenever you play a scoring card, worker spaces, elite spaces, church spaces, and uh, student and intellectual spaces all have some benefits to them. If you control at least one of those spaces in uh, uh, the country that's being scored, then there are certain advantages that uh, may come into play through the power struggle cards. So that's that's the, the one of the chief importance uh, of those things. All right, so that's uh, that's basically the map. Now the map, right as you see right here, and please don't click on any of the uh, the spaces because just clicking on them will generate uh, the little strength markers, uh, support markers. So don't do that if you would please. Uh, what we have here is the the default setup, and then once once you put all the pieces on the map like this, what you're going to do next, if you look over on the right hand side of the map, upper right hand corner, there is a setup instruction box, and so each player is going to place another seven uh, support points on the map after the initial hands of cards are drawn. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and draw up the cards and I'm not sure why it makes a difference. I'm not really careful about these sorts of things but the rule is is that when you're draw, uh, dealing out the cards that you deal to the communist player first. I, I suppose it probably does make a difference but um, what I'm going to do is that's a little trickier to do in Vassal. I'm just going to draw these things out. And I apologize that you will not be able to see these in uh, the live view that we have right now, but you will be able to see them in the YouTube video because I've got a screen capture thing here. All right, so we draw up our hand of cards, and basically you draw eight cards into your hand. There's no headline phase or anything like that in this game. So you draw your hand of cards up, and so to start the game, once you've seen your opening hand of cards, then the communist player may look at that and use that particular information to guide how he places his additional seven SPs. So, yeah, um, 
what I'm going to go ahead and do here, and like I said, please do not click on any of the, <laughs> the, the spaces because you generate support points. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and take the communists, and I'm just going to put a couple down here on the map based on what I see in the communist player's hand. It's never a bad idea to get a hold of Warsaw, so we'll go ahead and just increase Warsaw up to three. So they spend two to get control of Warsaw. And I should probably flip all these markers over. The darker side of the markers is really to designate uh, control of a space, and the lighter side is just to designate that you have support there, uh, but not necessarily control. So it, the, the module just kind of defaults it to the, uh, the darker side. And at the start of the game, there's only two spaces that are actually controlled, and they are controlled by the, uh, the Democrat player. It's the Lutheran Church, I think, and the, the uh, Czech writers. Okay, so the, the commies get to place uh, two support points. Then the uh, Democrat player, you can look at his hand, see what he's got in there. Uh, not a lot to write home about, so he's going to go ahead and place a couple. And he sees that, um, you know, that they're, maybe the communist player is putting some stuff in uh, Poland, so maybe we ought to do something along those lines. So, you know, put two into Krakow, and how about one into Poznan. And hey, Rob, just an FYI, I think it would be better that when the, the counters are, are uh, generated that they would default to the white side uh, rather than the dark side. Yeah, you know, I just when I was listening to you say that and realized that I screwed up <laughs> having them come up on the wrong side, so I can change that on the next version of the module, no problem. Yeah, no, no, no big deal. Okay, so... Um, the communists now get to and see. There's this an alternating thing that happens here. The commies place two. The democrats place three. Then the communists place three. Democrat will place four, and then the communists will get the last word with two more. So now we're at the stage where the communists can place three more, and not wanting to completely ignore what's happening in uh, uh, Hungary, I should probably put some in there. And by the way, adjacency I believe does apply to the. Uh, your starting placement so you can't just place support anywhere it does have to be adjacent to to another uh, space that you already have support in so what they're going to go ahead and do is oh and it cannot be excuse me get rid of that counter there uh, it cannot you cannot place the your starting support in a country any space that uh, contains enemy support points so you can't you know go into a space with uh, uh, where your opponent has uh, support so there, there are some ways that you can kind of get trapped here. So what will happen here is the communists will place one in uh, Gyor in uh, Hungary. And then they've got two more. Um, tell you what, I think we can chain this around. And I believe chaining does work in the setup. Again, I reserve the right to be wrong on any of this stuff. Okay, so now the Democrats get to place uh, four more, and so they'll just go ahead and uh, spend two there in Budapest, and they've got two more. Tell you what, let's get uh, Poznan in Poland. And that gives them control there. Okay, so that's that's the game setup, and again, this is not I, maybe the ideal setup and you do get to look at your opening hand and that may guide how you uh, how you place your starting support points. Once that's done it basically then becomes a game just like Twilight Struggle where you're going to play cards and try to place things on uh, place control on the map take control from your opponents. Uh, you do have a menu of operations that you can do with your uh, your op points. So what I'm going to go ahead and do here first I'm going to take the uh, communist hand. There we go. And let's just play this card here. Uh, heal our bleeding wound. And uh, I can play that as operations. And I presume it puts it in a box on the map. Yeah, it's over on the side of the map. Uh, okay, I'm scrolling all over. There we go. Okay, so puts it on the side of the map. There's our op points. Um, what you can do with operations points is real simple. There's, you can do one of two things, basically. You can either place support, or you can do what's called a support check. 
A support check is almost like a coup in Twilight Struggle. Um, it's not quite the same sort of thing, but it's pretty close. So you can use it to play support or do a, um, a support check. So with this, just no big surprises here. What I'll do is just go ahead and do a um, play support. And we'll do it to get control of the uh, elite space in Poland that I'm not going to try to pronounce. Hey, um, when you place the, the card into the ops box there, how do you get it out? What's, what's the optimal way to do that? Uh, if you right click on it, it'll let you send it back to the draw pile. Okay, it should go to the discard pile, yeah? Or should I just... Um, let's see, I, it's been a while since I made this thing. It actually, yeah, I just looked at it. It looks like it went into the draw pile instead of the discard. Is it... Um, yeah, no, I, I don't think I'm put in a way for it to go into the discard. Um, I think that discard pile I made just in case you have to actually... Is there a way you might have to actually discard a card out of your hand without playing it? I don't really... Oh, okay, so basically we just leave the, the card where it is until it's time for reshuffle? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the intent. Ah, gotcha. Okay, cool. All right, so then Democrats get to do something here. Um, just to show you some of the interesting types of cards that you end up with. Uh, this is a card that's kind of cool. It's called Consumerism. And this is a fun one to do as an event. Uh, the text says to remove a communist support point from a worker space. And again, this is where those little icons on the spaces are going to come into play. And make one support check in a worker space in the same country using the ops value from this card. If you play it in the late year, you remove three SPs from any space and make two support checks in any spaces using the ops value of this card. So with this one here, we could go ahead and target a uh, worker space. And a work, good worker space to target here, I think, would be, and again, it might be a little early to try this, but we could go ahead and use this one in, um, well, actually, that would be kind of a waste right now because it looks like there's not many workers that actually have communist alignment. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what, scratch that. We'll just use the op value on the card to do a support check. So I want to show you how support checks work. And we're going to do this one up here in Tata Banya in Hungary. And again, I apologize for the terrible pronunciations of these names. All right, now when you do a support check, again, it's like a coup from Twilight Struggle, but it's a little different. What you do is you take the op value of the card that you play, you roll a die, you add that uh, the die roll to the op value of the card, you also add plus one for every uh, adjacent country uh, to the target uh, that has your that's in control of your uh, faction. So, for example, if we target Tatanbania, uh, it is adjacent to Budapest, and Budapest has uh, is under uh, Democrat control, so we would get plus one there. Then you have minus one for each adjacent space that is controlled by your opponent. So uh, Milk Solok and Gior are adjacent to Tata Banya. So if they were under communist control, then there would be minus one for each of those. So it's almost like a mix between a coup and realignment from Twilight Struggle. Now, whenever you play a card for a support check, you get to do two support checks. Irrespective of the op value of the card, you get to do two support checks. So it doesn't matter if you play a one-op, two-op, three-op, or a four-op card, you always get two support checks, and they can be in the same or different countries, and uh, you use the, the same op value on both rolls. So we're going to target Tatanbani, and it has to be, a, the target country has, or target space has to be a space that has your opponent's uh, support points in it. So we'll target that, and we're going to roll a die, and die rolls a four. We add plus one because uh, Budapest has Democrat control and it's adjacent. So that becomes a five. To that we add the out value of the card, so that becomes an eight. Now we subtract double the um, stability number of the, sp the target space, Tatanbanya, which is three times two is six. When we subtract that, the result is two, and that's how many support points we can remove from mm -hmm. our opponent. And if there's any, um, if we remove all of their support and there's still points left over, then we can place our own support. 
So since the final result is 2, we can actually get rid of the one support point, uh, coming support point in Tatanbanya, and then we can place our, uh, use our final point to place our own support there. Now, Tatanbanya now has uh, Democrat uh, support points and no communist support points, so it is not a valid target for the second support check on this card. So for the second support check on the card, how about if we target... All right, well, it almost has no chance to succeed, but we'll go ahead and target Warsaw. Now, Warsaw is adjacent to the uh, communist elite uh, space in uh, Poland, which is under co communist control, so it's going to be a uh, minus one to our die roll. Ah, but we roll a six, that becomes a five, to which we add the three op value, so that becomes an eight. I'm sorry, it does have to be in the same country, huh? Diabolical. All right, so we'll have to target Gior then. Let's just, well, Milk Sulk is adjacent to Budapest. We'll target that one. So we rolled a six. Um, we add one for Budapest, so it becomes a seven, to which we add the three out value of the card. So it becomes a 10. We subtract six, which is double the stability number. And it leaves it with, with four points, which is the ideal number here, because it will remove the one and it allows to place three more, and so we basically took control of the space. So that's how support checks work in the game. Whoops. Wrong space. There we go. Okay, so that's that's basically how the whole op placement and uh, support checks work in the game. Now there are a couple other things happening on the map that you should be aware of and one of them that's very important is the Tiananmen Square track down the lower left hand corner. This is how this works. I'm going to open up my communist hand and having drawn a wonderful um, communist hand I feel the need to get rid of one of these cards here. One of those cards I want to get rid of is Solidarity Legalized. This is a real nasty event. It's almost like, it's kind of like the equivalent of the Marshall Plan in Twilight Struggle. It, it just puts a lot of support in a very uh, important region. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to be able to play this card but not trigger the event. And the one way you can do that is on the Tiananmen Square track. You can play one card per turn. And it's like the space race in uh, Twilight Struggle or... Um, in, in Labyrinth, if you did like a first plot as the Jihadist, you can dump a card without triggering the, uh, the effect. Uh, this is how you get rid of your opponent's cards. But again, you can only do this to one card per turn. So we'll try this in Tiananmen Square. Now here's how this works. What you do is you roll a die to which you add the odd value of the card that you play. And then you consult the, the leftmost space on the Tiananmen Square track uh, that does not contain your marker. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the the track right now, basically your marker, the first time you place it for the communist, it would go here. Then the next time you would be trying to enter here and so forth. And eventually you want to try to march across the map, uh, across that track on the map there. So th when, if, when you first begin the game, though, nobody has any presence on the Tiananmen Square track. So we're basically trying to get into that leftmost box there. So the number beneath the leftmost box for the communist is a 6 which means we'd have to roll a 2 or higher. So rolling a die of 5 plus 4 is more than enough, and so the communist Tiananmen Square marker can then enter that box. And in the physical game, you can actually flip the counter over. It's got like a white side to it. It's the same graphic, but a white background, so you can try you know, you know, to remember um, you know, when you've played something into the Tiananmen Square. I, I think in the Vassal module, um, you can actually put the card into... A uh, little box to, uh, for a mnemonic. Okay, so what this does is once you've entered the Tiananmen Square, uh, one of these boxes, if you are the only faction in that uh, that particular column and your opponent's marker is to the left, uh, then the effect of that column will apply to you. So from now on, there will be a plus one modifier for Tiananmen Square die rolls for the communist player. Now, as soon as the Democrat player enters there, then nobody gets that bonus. And of course, if the Democrats were to surge beyond, that the bonus in the leftmost column would, again, no longer apply. 
Now, some of the things with the Tiananmen Square track uh, are like a one-time use uh, effect, and that would be like here. For example, if the communist marker moved into the, uh, what is that, the People's Daily Denounces Protesters, the third column. If the communists were the first to enter that, then they would be able to draw three strategy cards from the draw pile. They can keep one and then discard the other two. And it's a, just a one-time use thing, and you do it immediately once the, the counter goes into that box. And then over on the to the right of that, there's another one. Uh, you remove two of your opponent's support points anywhere on the map, uh, and, and so forth. So, but again, you have to dice uh, higher than or equal to the number beneath uh, uh, on that particular mm -hmm. column. And those numbers are not necessarily the same across the board. You'll see that um, there, there's kind of like a curve for the uh, the communists, and there's a different sort of curve for the Democrats, where it gets increasingly more difficult for the Democrats to advance on the Tiananmen Square track. So for our purposes here, uh, communists got into that box there. Uh, there's one other track on the game map that doesn't really do anything. Um, I'm wondering if it used to do something, maybe in playtests. Uh, it, it's kind of an interesting thing on the map, but it's not terribly important. Um, and that is the USSR stability track. And what this does is as certain events are played, like the Saudis, was it Saudis? Ah, I have no idea how to pronounce it. Uh, whenever that particular event is played, the stability marker would go down into that box, and there would be a plus one um, point added to the victory track. That particular event does allow play of the Baltic Way, and so when that was played as an event, then there would be plus three points added. That then gives way to, um, uh, to the, the breakaway... Uh, Baltic Republics, which is a big point value for the Democrat player, and so forth. So it's kind of a cool little oddity to, to keep track of what's going on in the USSR. So it's just a neat, neat flavor thing there. Okay, so Ted says he pronounced it Saudis. All right, excellent. Uh, the victory track down on the bottom is pretty straightforward, plus uh, whenever you're adding victory points, it's favorable to the Democrat. Subtracting victory points, always favorable to the Communist. Uh, the instant the marker reaches either plus or minus 20, the game ends with a victory at that point. Um, I want to take you through a power struggle here. But let's go ahead and do one more uh, Democrat card here. Democrats drew a pretty, um, pretty horrible hand, actually. And trying to decide what to do with this horrible hand is part of the fun of the game. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's just play this one here, see what this does. Um, nomenclatura is going to be played, and the choice is place uh, three communist drink points. Uh, support points, excuse me, in any elite spaces, or remove all Democrat uh, SPs from elite spaces. Tell you what, we'll go ahead and let the commies do this one first. And it probably makes sense to go ahead and have the commies use those in Hungary. So that pretty much gives them control of the elite space there in Hungary. Now they got two SPs to use. Um, Let's see, doing pretty well in Hungary. Let's go ahead and see if we can get something going here in uh, Poland. So let's go ahead and do this. Spend two to get control of the university. Now, you'll notice this, the um, stability numbers. Let me get rid of this card here. Play as Ops Democrat. There we go. Uh, you'll notice the stability numbers on the student spaces are very low. So it's kind of like those, those really unstable... Uh, countries in Twilight Struggle, like in Africa, Central, and South America, you have some of these one countries that, you know, basically there's constantly coups back and forth. Well, the universities can kind of be like that. I mean, the Democrat player needs to get in there so he can get to the Polish writers. Uh, you can't just put support in Polish writers as a Democrat because it's not linked to any spaces where you have any presence. So, uh, 
you want to try to you put more than one um, support point though in that university because then the opponent can just turn around and uh, do a support check on you there and just really hurt you. And that is probably what I would do with the communists here. So let's just take the commie cards. Um, hmm. Yeah, this is a fun one. How about this? Uh, Gorbachev charms the West. And we'll play this one for the event. This is a kind of a cool event here because we remove two opponent support points and make support check using that value of this card. But it is not playable after breakaway Baltic Republics. So with this one here, where would we want to remove? I would probably try to take them away from the Catholic Church. And if I do that, let's see. I'll take one away from the Catholic Church and one away from Krakow. And then we'll do the support check at the university using that value of this card. Now it's only one... Uh, the event stipulates do a support check, not two. So remember, when you're playing a card for ops, you do two support checks, but you don't do that with an event unless the event clearly states to do two support checks. So in this case, we just get one whack at it. And a three plus four is seven. There's no other modifiers. So seven minus two is five. Wiping out the support brings it down to three, and so it allows the communists to flip-flop things there. Now, it might sound like the game could boil down into constant support checks in universities, but eventually what's going to happen is there are events that are going to come into play that are going to discourage the communist player from doing that. There will be victory point penalties for doing support checks in universities and uh, intellectual spaces, the typewriter spaces, after the Helsinki, I can't remember the exact name of the event, but there's a, like a Helsinki resolution or something like that. Uh, when that event is played, then there's like a 1VP penalty every time you try to do that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is take the Democrat hand here. And again, they have just a very, very wretched, horrible hand here. But saved one good unaligned card, and we can use this thing here to uh, try to reestablish a few things. Need to get control of Krakow and the Catholic Church again. And it will get into lots. So four SPs there. Okay, and I can realize that you know this is how the game moves back and forth. The the events are not um, cookie cutter copies from Twilight Struggle. There's some very interesting and tough decisions going on with a lot of the the cards in the game. What I want to do now is I want to show you how a uh, scoring card will work. So what we have here is a power struggle in Poland. This may not be the most opportune time to play it, but uh, for demo purposes, we're going to go ahead and do this now. So we're going to play this as an event. And what we're going to do with this is, whenever you do a power struggle, there's a, a whole process that you go through. It's a little bit more involved than what you have in Twilight Struggle, but this is where you encounter the game within the game. The first thing that's going to happen is we're going to deal power struggle cards uh, to both players. And the number of cards you get is based on how many uh, spaces you control in the country being scored. In this case, we have here is we have uh, three, uh, three spaces controlled by the Democrats. You have uh, Pozhenon, Krakow, and the Catholic Church controlled by the Democrats. And then you have uh, the Communist Elite Space, the University, and Warsaw controlled by the Communists. So both sides control three spaces. The number of cards you get is basically you get six cards for the first space that you control and then two cards for every space thereafter. So in this case here, uh, both players are going to get ten cards. So here in the module, we actually have uh, Power Struggle, oh I see, here we are, Democrat PS cards. Alright, so I'm just going to draw ten Democrat PS cards, and I'm just going to show you a sample of what they look like, and we'll put them out onto the onto the map. 
So they get 10, and then the communists get uh, 10. Okay, now the Power Struggle cards, uh, if you've ever played Hannibal, this is going to, you, you'll catch on to this right away. Or if you've ever played We the People, this is a very, um, very, very familiar mechanic here. It's, it, and it works really cool with this game system. What you end up with is you actually have different suits of cards. You have a wild cards, which have, in the physical copy of the game, they have a, um, like a red W in the upper left-hand corner. The... Um, in the Vassal module, the cards, I think, are a little bit smaller, and so the symbols are, are uh, sub, more, a little bit more subdued. So you have wild cards. You have uh, cards that have... You know what? Actually, here in the Vassal module, they don't have the shapes that they have in the module. Okay, well, it's it's the shapes are not terribly important, um, but in the physical game, you actually have different shapes. I think Strike is a, a square, Marches are circles, um, let's see, uh, petitions are hexagons, I'm trying to find one here, yeah, petition would be like a hexagon, um, if you do rally in the square, it would be like a triangle, and then you have leaders that are stars, so there, there's different shapes to pick out, easily identify the different suits in the physical game, so it's a little bit different here in the Vassal module, but I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, what will happen here is whoever plays the power struggle card is considered the attacker in the power struggle. And what he's going to do is select one card from his hand and he's going to play it. Now some of these cards are leader's cards. Let me cover this real quick before we start doing this. And in order to play a leader card, leader cards are kind of like a wild card. They can, when you play it as an attacker, you can declare it to be any suit that you want and if you are responding as the defender, it's a wild card and will match any suit. Um, the problem is, is that in order to play a card, you actually have to control the, uh, an appropriate space in the target country. So for Poland, the communists actually do control the elite space. So the elite leader is playable by them. However, the, uh, the Polish writer's space, the intellectual space, is uh, not controlled by anyone, so that intellectual leader is basically a dead heart card in his hand. It's not usable at all by him. So that's something to be aware of. Before you actually start playing cards, after you've drawn your cards, what you can do is either or both players may uh, declare that they are going to up the stakes. And to do so, they have to discard, and I believe the discards are face up, discard three cards from their hand. So this is a good way to get rid of maybe those unplayable cards from your hand, uh, and especially if you have a card advantage over your opponent. Now what raising the stakes does is when a power struggle is all said and done, uh, dice are going to be cast on the power struggle results table that you find right above the Tiananmen Square track, and it's going to result in, in two things are going to happen. Your, the loser of the power struggle is going to lose support in the country based on a die roll there, and also going to potentially lose victory points. And if the Democrat wins, there's a, then there's a 50-50 chance, basically, that the, uh, the communists will lose control of the country. Whenever a player raises the stakes, then a plus one die roll modifier applies on this table. If both players raise the stakes, then there is a, a plus one for both of them on that. So what will happen here, the communist player, um, you know, obviously he looks at his hand and if he's got a lot of a particular suit of cards, then that's probably a card he's going to want to lead off on because the chances are his opponent doesn't have very many of those. So what he'll do here is he'll play a march and it's got a strength of six. So now the Democrat player has to play a march and basically in order to match that card. If he fails to do so, then he loses the power struggle. So he can play a march, he can match it with a leader, or he can match it with a wild card. So looking at his hand, um, he's actually going to go ahead and do this. He's going to play a wild card here. It's tactic fails, match any suit. That suit cannot be played again, this power struggle. So this completely hoses the uh, communist player's uh, strategy here because he had a whole bunch of march cards in his hand. So now he can't play those. But since the uh, the card played by the defender 
uh, stipulates that he loses the initiative, the communists retain the initiative and get to lead with another card from their hand. So they'll pick out something else and they're going to go with a petition. Now petitions are interesting because if you win a power struggle with a petition there is a minus two modifier on the, um, uh, the, the power struggle results table. And I'm not sure why that doesn't stipulate it on the cards here. Yeah, it's like a probe from Hannibal. It doesn't stipulate on the cards here in Vassal, and I don't see it on the table, but I know it says it in the physical game. All right, so he plays a, uh, a petition. Now the defender, Democrat, he's got to find that. Uh, find something to match it. Now the Democrat, if he's thinking, you know, I'm probably going to lose this thing, well, mate, petition's probably not a way to lose the, a power struggle for, for the Democrat player because it's going to be a minus two modifier, and so your chances of toppling the communist player from power in that country is uh, greatly minimized. So what he's going to do is he's going to counter that with one of his leaders. He's going to use a church leader since he controls the Catholic Church, he can play that. Yeah, I'm sorry about this, Rob. Um, I didn't notice this earlier. I just, uh, but on, on the petition card, there's a minus two modifier on the power struggles, and then on Rally in the Square, let me double check it here. On Rally in the Square, it should also indicate that there's a plus. I think a plus two modifier. I think it's like the opposite of the uh, the power struggle, uh, of the petition, excuse me. Hold on just a second, let me get a physical card here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I just looked at the physical cards and yes, it does say uh, minus two on the uh, petition cards to the, uh, the power struggle results, die rolls, and then on rallying the square, it's plus two on those. Okay, so they use church leader to match petition. So what happens here uh, is we're going to make a die roll, and the, the defender has to dice against the strength of the attacker's card. So the attacker's card has a strength of six, so he has to roll a six in order to uh, seize the initiative. And this is basically, you know, if you played Hannibal, you dice against the, uh, the other general's um, tactical skill, I think is what you dice against, in order to seize the initiative. In this case, he failed, so now the communists get to play another card, and they'll play another petition. So the Democrats have got to match that, and, well, they can't match it. All they have left is this, and that is uh, your, your opponent basically has to discard two random cards. I'm not sure how that happens in the module. Is there a way to randomly uh, remove cards from a player's hand? Uh, no, not randomly. I think you'll, you'll just have to, you know, say discard the second and fourth one in your hand or something like that. Okay, cool. And it's no problem. I just uh, I see a return PS cards, but I'm afraid to press it because I think it might just get rid of all of them. Yeah, no, that'll send them all back when you're done with the whole thing. So you want to wait to do that to the end. Okay, so in this case, what I would do is I would just, since there's just a few left in here, I roll that. Okay, so rallying the square is going to get discarded. I'll just throw that out onto the map. It'll go away in just a moment. And I'll roll another one. And it's going to get rid of that one. Okay, so they matched it, but uh, the thing about that particular card to match so, uh, falters is they, they don't gain the initiative. So the communist player still holds the initiative, um, but he's running out of things to do. So what he's going to do is he's got to make a tough choice. He can either play his elite leader and choose a suit. Now he knows he's getting close. He thinks he might be getting close to breaking through you know, and, and winning this. But that's the only playable card he has left in his hand. The only other card the communist has in his hand that he can play is uh, this card, Support Surges, which would cost him the initiative, but he gets to draw two Power Struggle cards. But what if he draws the wrong ones? So I think it would be better just to do this, 
play the elite leader and choose petition because we know that that one is having a problem for the, the Democrats. And Democrats only have an elite leader in their hand and so they are on a, the rest are marches and strikes so they have no ability to match it so they lose the power struggle. Okay, having lost the power struggle, nobody up the ante. Um, there we go. Uh, nobody up the uh, up the ante or uh, played. The, the power struggle was not won with rallying the square or with um, with a. Uh, oh, actually, it was one with a petition. So there's going to be a minus two modifier here on the uh, victory point. So the communists probably aren't going to score much here. All right, support loss rule is a 1 modified down to 0, so there's no support lost. But if support had been lost, then the owner, the losing player, would get to choose wh what uh, uh, spaces lose support. So it's not the winner that actually gets to choose that. And then for VPs, another die is cast. Ooh, it's a 6. Minus 2 is a 4. And the result is a 2 slash P. The P is ignored because the communists won. So the communists get 2 points. But here's the big deal. Because the communists won the power struggle, they retain power in the country. So what we're going to do is you take a support point marker and you put it on the little star next to the country. And you put a 1 the first time the communists win there. Then... The, since if the communists win the power struggle, you take the uh, if you look at the little scoring chart there uh, next to Poland. Let me zoom in here for the viewers on Vassal. You'll see that it gives you the the scoring information, presence, domination, control. All right, beneath it it says power three times number played. Okay, what that means is if the communists retain power, they get three points times the number of cards that that scoring card has been played. This is the first time the scorecard has been played, uh, so it's, they're going to get three times one, three more points. So you can see there's a snowballing effect if the communists either win, keep winning these power struggles in, a, in Poland, or if they even retain power in Poland, uh, then the Democrats could get really behind the curve. All right, so next thing we do is we do the regular scoring, and it's just like Twilight Struggle. Um, in this case right here, both sides control three spaces, so neither side has domination or control for that matter. So both sides are going to have presence for three VPs, and then plus one for uh, battleground spaces, which are the spaces that have the colored stripe across the top. So Poznan and Krakow are battleground spaces for the Democrats, Warsaw is the only battleground for the communists, so there's a net shift of minus, or, yeah, plus one point, so the VP marker goes back one to the uh, Democrat side. And that's the scoring. Now, if the Democrats win the uh, power struggle, then the scorecard is removed from the game. So that's a big deal. Uh, but if the communists win, then it remains in play and will eventually come up again, in all likelihood. That is really the, the heart of the game, uh, guys. That's um, I realize this might be a little bit shorter than what we normally do for demos, but this basically is how the game works. And it's, I think, an easier game to jump into, especially for someone that's not a hardcore gamer. I think this one is, is more approachable than Twilight Struggle because the decision-making is difficult, but not, uh, not as difficult you don't have quite as many choices uh, you know, to wrap your head around when you're first learning the game. But the choices you have, they're, they're still not easy. And there's, there's all kinds of little things happening along the side that you have to consider. So all in all, I think that this game is right in between Twilight Struggle and uh, 1960 Making of the President. I think it's a little bit more complex than Making of the President, uh, but not much so. Um, and I think it's it's definitely its own game. I mean, it's not a, a Twilight Struggle clone. I think it's its it's its own game, and really does a real good job of capturing the feel of this particular year. Uh, 1989 is is kind of a kind of a cool year to uh, look back on. Uh, I know I know this one lady in uh, in my church, and she was telling me how 
she, her husband was stationed over in, in Germany uh, when all these things were happening. And just by chance, uh, she happened to be in Berlin the night that they began to tear the wall down. And uh, it was just by happenstance, happened to be in the right place at the right time. And it's really cool talking to somebody you know, that was actually there when these events took place. But uh, as, as a game, I think this is a really fun game. I think it plays maybe a little bit faster than Twilight Struggle. There has been discussion on Board Game Geek about play balance. I think it's way too early to address that um, because uh, you know as you, as you play the game more, you're gonna you're gonna discover more nuances to the game. Because uh, I, I remember when I first started playing Twilight Struggle, most of our games ended early, um, and you know after after we got more experience with the game and with the nuances of the system, then routinely I find games going down to the wire. So I think that that's probably going to be the case with this. There's other ways to play it besides Vassal. This is a great module, by the way. Um, thanks, thanks, Rob, for putting this together. Um, you can also play it on, on War Game Room. And that's a, that's a really cool way to play, by the way, because it does enforce the rules of the game. Uh, so if you, you know, it's easy to forget little things like when you're doing support checks that you have to do them both in the same country. Um, the War Game Room program will force those rules upon you. The only downside to War Game Room is it's a little tricky to get to work on a Mac. It can be done and actually does work really well. Uh, it's just that there's a few little things you have to do to get it to work. Uh, if anyone needs to know how to do that, just uh, feel free to ask on online. Uh, there's, there's some instructions that uh, Bruce gave me that uh, worked like a charm. The only other downside is that the cards are so much more they're graphic in uh, Vassal, so you can look at the card, you can feel them, it's more like playing the physical game. Whereas with War Game Room, I feel like I have to have the cards in front of me, so I usually play with uh, the physical cards uh, in front of my computer, so I can read them faster than going through the interface. But uh, this is 1989, I think uh, Ted and company, they did a great job on this, and uh, this is definitely a keeper for me. Appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Um, and thanks, Ted, for showing up. It's always great when the designer comes up, especially when uh, somebody that actually knows how to pronounce these names. <laughs>